Good evening and welcome to MDFA's final webinar of the year on neovascular AMD, an update on management and research. My name is Mira and I'm an optometrist and the healthcare relations manager with the MDFA. Before we begin, in the spirit of reconciliation, the MDFA acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Firstly, some housekeeping. All attendee cameras and microphones have been turned off. If you have any questions, please enter them via the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Your questions will be answered at the end of the presentation, but feel free to type them out at any time. You can also use the chat function for any interactivity with our presenter. The webinar today has been accredited by Optometry Australia for one CPD hour. The learning objectives for the webinar can be seen on the screen now. Tonight, we are delighted to be joined by Dr. James Wong. James is a medical retina specialist based in Sydney. He is a consultant ophthalmologist in the medical retina unit at the Sydney Eye Hospital clinical lecturer at Sydney University and director of research at Strathfield Retina Clinic. James has been a principal investigator on multiple international clinical therapeutic trials in retina and macular disorders for over a decade. Please welcome Dr. James Wong. Thank you very much, Mira, and thank you to the MDFA for having me talk to you this evening. Very good. So uh, tonight I'm going to be speaking about new vascular macular degeneration as an update. Uh, these are my financial disclosures. So this is my talk overview tonight. So I'll be talking about some of the new nomenclature to, to describe new vascular macular degeneration. Also some tips on macular clinical examination, talking about the treatment paradigms for wet AMD and the impact of COVID and some of the newer treatments we have for new vascular macular degeneration, Brelastizumab, the port delivery system, furosemab, and some of the pipeline and new trials. And there's some cases at the end. So firstly, the new nomenclature for new vascular macular degeneration. Uh, Conan, you all know Conan the Barbarian. Um, we also have Conan, the consensus uh, nomenclature for reporting new vascular age-related macular degeneration. So this is a group looking at uh, how we actually label macular degeneration, in particular the atrophic and the new vascular forms. So this is a table showing that some of the old terminology in the right eye and what we're replacing it with nowadays, and it's sort of terminology which is coming into more uh, common use. So on the right, we have occult choroidal new vascularization, and now we have type one macular new vascularization. So it's gonna quickly go through some of this. Now we're going to be talking about macular new vascularization rather than choroidal new vascularization. And this is really to identify that new vascularization can come mostly from the choroid, but can also arise from the retinal circulation. So to have a bit more of a broad terminology for this. Type 1 MNV is a new vascular complex below the retinal pigment epithelium arising from the choroid. And we used to call this the occult type of CNV. And if we happen to do a fluorescein angiogram, we'd see a stippled hyper hyperfluorescence on the fluorescein. Uh, this is a little diagrammatic showing you what happens in a type 1 MNV. Uh, we can see that uh, there's a hemorrhage here, and the nevascular complex is uh, under the uh, RPE. Uh, you can see, hopefully, you can see my laser pointer here. Uh, this is the RPE, and this is the nevascular complex coming from the choroid underneath the RPE. Uh, this is one of our patients who's got a pigment epithelial detachment and some fluid uh, showing a type 1 uh, MNV. And when we did a, a ICG angiogram, we can see this uh, nevascular complex here uh, lighting up. This patient uh, had baseline vision of 6 on 60 and uh, was treated with anti-VEGF injections and has done 
quite nicely with some flattening of the PED over time. So type 2 MNV is a new vascular complex below the neurosensory retina, but above the RPE. And this is uh, maybe associated with what we call subretinal hyperreflective material or SHRM and separation of the neurosensory retina. Um, this is uh, what we used to call the classic uh, CNV. And if we did an angiogram, we'd see an increasing area of hyperfluorescence on the angiogram. So SHRM, or you can have a little mushroom picture here, is uh, an OCT diagnosis. And we can see that it is this kind of medium gray material between these two layers here. Um, and it can be a sign of uh, activity. It's exudation into the subretinal space, which is more optically dense than the surrounding material. And it's made up of serum, fibrin, inflammatory cells, and not red blood cells. It can lead to fibrosis and can be a good indicator of a poor prognosis if you happen to see it on the OCT. Uh, this is a type 2 MNV. You can see uh, on the uh, histology diagram on the left, the RPE, these little brown cells here, but now the new vascular complex is above that and between the, this area here and the neurosensory retina. So it's underneath the neurosensory retina. You can sometimes get a combination of the type 1 and type 2 MNVs, we used to call a minimally classic new vessel, uh, which has both components. There's a type 3 MNV, and this is where you get hyperreflectivity from the middle layers to the IPE, where you get interretinal fluid, hemorrhage, and telic dectactic vessels. And this is where you have a new vascular complex going down from the retinal to the uh, choroidal area. And this is what we used to call a RAP or retinal angiomatous proliferation, which uh, uh, Don Gass coined many years ago. So this is a, a complex here, sort of joining the retinal and the choroidal circulations. Um, used to be debated which way it goes. Does it come from the choroid and goes up to the retina or does it start in the retina and go down to the choroid? But it seems to join in the middle. This is uh, one of Gas's original uh, paper diagrams showing uh, a complex here and this sort of volcano-like structure joining the retinal and the um, choroidal circulations here. Uh, it's important to know this because it can be an aggressive lesion. If treated early, it can do well, uh, but if left too long, it can get a guided prognosis. And it's interesting that it seems to be associated with a high risk of macular atrophy as well. Uh, this is a more established type 3 MNV showing you a complex going all the way from the choroid to the retinal circulation here. ICG angiography is a very helpful test to uh, use uh, in order to determine this. You can see this a RAP lesion type 3 MNV uh, joining the retinal and choroidal circulations there. So this is an early type 3 MNV. Um, showing a progression over time on the right here uh, to from small amounts to a um, area here. And this is a later lesion where you've got more fluid and more leakage. Uh, and this is often a, this kissing sign you can see on the OCT there uh, where there is a junction between this uh, retinal part and the pigment epithelial detachment. So this is one of our patients who had a type 3 MNV. 74 year old Asian lady who had vision of six on 15. Uh, you can see a very similar location, the hot spot on a fluorescein and ICG angiography here, often the characteristic of a, an extra foveal uh, interretinal hemorrhage uh, associated with fluid. Um, if caught early, it can do well, and you can see on the top uh, prior to treatment and uh, below uh, one month later after one, one injection, you can see some nice resolution of that fluid. So uh, this is that same patient, interestingly, over seven years, uh, you can see the uh, drusenoid PEDs and uh, uh, has sort of settled down, but it's been replaced by some fibrosis. And you can see these areas of atrophy on the uh, diagram, uh, on the uh, uh, scout uh, scan there as well, showing that, that there is increased um, macular atrophy with type three MNV. Polyportal choroidal vasculopathy or PCV, um, is probably a subvariant of uh, new vascular macular degeneration. It's a, an exudative hemorrhagic chororetinopathy, which often affects the macular and peripapillary area. Um, there's been some attempt to try to reclassify this as a type 1 MNV polyportal. Uh, I think there's some terminology which we'll probably keep using, like PCV or polyportal. I think sometimes it gets a little bit confusing to do all the rest of it. So 
even though there are some new terminology, I think that we see some things which we'll still be using because we've been using them for some time. So the OCT features of PCV, you can often get uh, polyp vessels and the branching vascular network complexes. Uh, the polyp vessels are sharp protrusions of the RPE with moderate reflectivity before uh, below the RPE. Um, and you can get these very shallow PEDs with the BVN, where you've got this double layer sign where Brooks membrane can split uh, and you have the network within those two layers. Uh, this is one of our patients who's had a polyp lesion, a sort of serosanguinous area here, a lot of exudation here. Uh, a fluorescent angiogram shows uh, just leakage in there, but an ICG angiogram shows nicely these polyp lesions on the right here. ICG is the uh, investigation of choice, really. You can see these nice um, polyp lesions underneath the PEDs quite nicely on the OCT. And this is uh, corresponding to a nice cluster of polyps on the ICG angiogram. This area here is the branching vascular network in that <clears throat> uh, lesion. So this is the fluorescein and ICG showing the simultaneous leakage on here with a highlighting polyp lesion there. So does it really matter to know the subtype of MNV and does this influence our treatment? So we know we have uh, treatment for uh, new vascular macular degeneration, um, Avastin, uh, Lucentis, Ilea, Beaview. We can also use steroids sometimes, uh, implants, dexamethasone, tramcinolone. In some situations, less commonly now, thermal laser may be appropriate or PDT laser. Um, so in terms of type 3 MNV, um, there was a paper a little while ago looking at uh, outcomes of using injections for RAP, type 3 MNV. Uh, it's found that the uh, if you treat early, um, it is good, but it can decline after that. And prognostic factors in favor of better outcomes were smaller size, better vision, and uh, which makes sense in terms of many types of uh, MNV. So what about um, using treatment for polyportal? Um, we were involved in the PLANET study some years ago, which looked at um, a flibicept or ILEA plus or minus rescue PDT laser for polyportal lesions. The bottom line is that about 85% of people with polyportal lesions were still fine with monotherapy with a flipercept and did not need a rescue PDT. Uh, PDT is the older style uh, laser and where you inject a green dye and shine a laser in the eye uh, where the dye has taken up uh, specifically on the um, the tissue which is uh, bad and uh, the idea is to preserve the good tissue uh, so that still has a role in certain lesions. Um, we looked at uh, some of our data in terms of uh, treatment for patients with uh, new vascular macular degeneration depending on the CNV type um, and looking at type 1, 2, 3, uh, polyportal. Um, the groups were mostly matched there it's interesting that when we see some of these graphs of vision that we see an initial improvement in vision across all groups here in the year first year, but some decline over time. And this is quite common when we see patients with any form of treatment for new vascular macular degeneration. And it's not often, and it's not because they're undertreated, but other things like macular atrophy or geographic atrophy catch up with patients. Um, so in all groups, you see a decline at year, uh, you know, seven to 10, and in one group, even with the polyportal, it was actually even worse than patients started. Um, but that may be for other reasons. Um, certainly OCT uh, improvement, uh, it was uh, important. Um, and we can see this uh, uh, all lesions uh, types improved over the time. So knowing the subtype can uh, give us an idea in terms of prognosis, uh, type 1 MNB you may get less atrophy uh, and it may be protective against geographic atrophy. Uh, type 3 MN MNV may give you more atrophy and sometimes it can be more aggressive uh, if left alone uh, for too long. Therefore, treating early is important. Um, some polyportal lesions may respond better to PDT than anti-VEGF. So the next section I was going to go through about is some of the tips on uh, macular clinical examination. In the scope of this talk, I won't be talking about any of some of the imaging things, but these are some of the things that just uh, at our 
um, in our clinic, uh, just uh, what can we do to try to help uh, make diagnoses as well. Um, so BCVA is still a really important <clears throat> uh, indicator of how people are going, obviously. Uh, and obviously, if there's a change that may indicate a problem in the macula, uh, AMSLA charts, uh, despite its simplicity, is actually still a very elegant way of picking up macular problems, um, anything from macular degeneration to macular holes, uh, vitreo macular traction. And it's a very simple test. Uh, and I would encourage all of you who don't already do this just to put your patients on this and just record what they see. And as you know, important covering one eye at a time, uh, reading distance, uh, and in recording, getting your patients to record what they see with a pen and date it and repeating it at whatever interval, a week, a month later to uh, sometimes daily to see if there's any change and just recording the progression of that. So it's a very helpful way to um, record any differences. And you say, well, how useful is it in terms of how accurate uh, is an AMSA grid? Um, so this was one paper from a little while ago, which uh, looked at um, a meta-analysis of AMSA grids as well as the hyperacuity machines um, and basically they found that the Amsterdam grid was uh, pretty sensitive at uh, 0.78 and pretty specific, specific at 0.97 in terms of detecting any macular issues there. Uh, so which is quite, uh, quite reassuring that it is, can be uh, quite a useful way to pick up um, uh, macular problems with such a simple test. Um, what about at the slit lamp? Um, People wonder what type of slit lamp lens should we be using in order to pick things up. And I guess for day-to-day -day work, I think having still a high magnification lens is helpful. Um, the 78 is a workhorse. Uh, I think if you uh, had the choice, um, sometimes uh, some of the other lenses like a Super 66, uh, personally, I think sometimes it does give you a little bit more um, stereo and binocular uh, than a 78, but there's there's not a huge amount of difference between them. Uh, the wide fields, uh, looking at the peripheral retina, 90D is a small footprint and can uh, get into small, um, around small eyes. Uh, personally, I think uh, the super field or the 100D is really nice as well. Um, so there's another trick in terms of looking with the slit lamp. Um, turn up the beam of light um, for a short time because just the high intensity does give you uh, much more uh, better visibility of the macular architecture and put it on a high magnification on your slit and whatever you can uh, put it on a uh, high short time, high intensity, high mag, and it can give you a, a lot more detail than you would actually expect. Um, using macular retro illumination can be very helpful too. You all know how to retro illuminate looking for uh, things like transillumination defects for irises and various things. But having the slit beam, say, bouncing off the RP level, and if it's a thickened macula with cystoid macular edema, for example, or even a shallow subretinal fluid for sensory detachment, you can actually see some of the um, light bouncing back and actually creating little cysts or uh, layers of fluid uh, on the slit lamp. So that's quite a useful way uh, to do it as well. Um, don't forget your red free light. Um, it's on all the slit lamps and, and it's a really helpful thing to determine hemorrhages in retinal vessels. Um, the Watsky Allen test is a very helpful thing too, um, which uh, uh, it's a very simple test, which uh, is really like a surrogate OCT in some way. Um, and I'll just go through that in a moment. Well, this is just a, a list of some of the lenses that you all know about, um, but um, the different companies uh, have different uh, options there uh, and some of the bulk lenses have these the digital and digital high mag uh, something i think the incremental differences between the digital ones and the standard ones are, are probably becoming less and less um, but uh, it's still uh, you know some people find it does get them out a little bit more in the periphery uh, personally i think there's not much difference in the high mag digital ones um, and the other ones as well but i think it's just good to have your own um, selection there so this is the red free light um, on the slit lamp. You can see on the left here, having vessels a bit more prominent, you can see a hemorrhage down here a bit more prominently than a normal slit lamp um, white color beam. Uh, Microaneurysms and other flame hemorrhages are more enhanced on the slit lamp there as well. And those of you who have a, a red free fundus camera can often use that as well for the, with the same effect and can give an idea about which layers uh, hemorrhages are in the eye. What's the Allen test? You remember, this is a very simple test. You 
get your patient on the seat lamp and you put a very thin beam of uh, light uh, and you get them to look at the beam and uh, you know 50 to 100 microns wide and you can do it vertically and horizontal and you can ask the patient is the beam uh, straight or is there a gap in the middle or and they can draw uh, what they see uh, so it can be helpful just to diagnose any macular holes any between macular traction um, and again, the, the sensitivity was uh, found to be about 93% with about 33% specificity, uh, specificity on, on the Watt scale and test for picking up immaculate uh, holes specifically. So a very simple test uh, you can do at the slit lamp. Um, thirdly, I'm gonna be talking about some of the uh, treatment paradigms that we use in uh, treatment of new vascular macular degeneration. So in the beginning when uh, when we had uh, only laser treatment, if you go back way into the 70s, uh, laser photocoagulation was sort of uh, thought to be helpful, but it wasn't really until sort of the 90s um, where the MPS was the most helpful study, which found that basically if you blasted a macular new vessel with an argon laser straight through the middle, um, it would stop that vessel getting bigger, uh, even though you destroyed their central vision. Um, it would stop it from getting bigger. And it sounds barbaric now, but um, in those days, it was the best thing. And I still have patients from who've had that type of treatment from before. And um, it was helpful to, to in a certain degree, but obviously with uh, quite significant after effects as well. PDT came in in the uh, mid nineties. Um, then anti vegf came in 2004. We've had lots of evolution over since then. So the original protocols for the injections were um, monthly injections. Um, so, um, and in the beginning, uh, 24 injections over two years uh, was the best um, uh, data, which showed there was improvement and loss, prevention of loss of vision. Quite early on, there were studies to say, well, how about we do three uh, monthly and then every three months after that? And this is the peer study. Um, so they basically found that it wasn't as good. So the, the top graphs here are the monthly injections with Lucensis at that point, and the two lower graphs are uh, initial three monthly injections given, and then every three months after, and you can see the patients did uh, significantly worse in this group. So every three months after the initial was not good, but every month was good at that point. Um, so now we use this treat and extend protocol where we load um, injections three in a row monthly usually and then if things are stable then we can extend the treatment interval between uh, the injections to try to determine what is the maximum fluid free interval um, so we often use uh, oct vision and other clinical findings like macular hemorrhage to determine if it's uh, active or not and uh, doing it this way we can reduce burden load uh, we can individualize treatment we can still maintain vision in a similar to the original trial of monthly injections. So we're all about trying to minimize clinic visits for patients to reduce the need for carers to come with them, the you know, time out of work, and obviously um, now with uh, you know, COVID risks and things like that, it just helps to obviously to have less treatment um, if we can still maintain vision. And using a treat and extend protocol has been helpful to achieve this. Um, can also work not only with macular degeneration, with diabetic macular edema as well. Um, again, when you think about uh, having less treatment, uh, it can be a certain burden uh, financially uh, on uh, governments. Uh, we know now that the injections, Ilea, uh, Nibismab, Flibercept are the highest uh, cost on the PBS, uh, over having overtaken um, uh, Lipitor cholesterol drug uh, a few years ago. However, the cost um, of uh, supporting a, a blind person is significantly higher. And so cost benefit is uh, definitely in favor of um, uh, providing treatment for Australians with new vascular macular degeneration. What about COVID and how that uh, had an impact on medical retina services? So interestingly, in the our American colleagues, uh, the ASRS, the American Society of Retina Specialists, surveyed quite early on in May 2020, um, just as it was COVID was taking off, um, and 60% of the reduction in patient attendance, um, quite significantly, and uh, 
patients were uh, not coming in due to fear, uh, family fears, but also transport difficulty and even lack of PPE at that point. So we know that uh, in that time that many patients received delayed injections, 43% uh, were delayed by two to four weeks and um, you know, quite um, unfortunately, many people were lost to follow up in that. In Australia, there was still uh, some degree, not to the same extent as it was in the US. Um, and there was still, we had some patients uh, who were still uh, not coming in for fear and would uh, risk losing vision or having worse outcomes due to lack of treatment. The MDF was really crucial in trying to turn that about quickly. And, uh, and I think it's very, very thankful for them to get the message out there early and, and uh, really forcefully that uh, it's uh, really important to maintain injections because without it people lose vision the highest risk to vision loss in wet macular degeneration is lack of injections and uh, you know Australia does pretty well compared to the rest of the world in maintaining vision uh, due to the number of injections that patients are receiving and uh, Ita Butros was obviously very influential in um, getting the message out there so what happens actually if you do stop treatment? Uh, we looked at some of our data again. Uh, what happens when you stop in wet macular degeneration? Um, so just flip through this. So essentially we looked at some uh, two groups of patients, uh, ones who stopped completely, uh, but were found to follow up later. Um, and those who stopped for about six months and then restarted. So this is the group who uh, started treatment and then stopped for six months. And we can see that the initial climb or benefit in vision, uh, when they stopped for six months, it did drop to a bit below when they started, but when they restarted, they were able to maintain um, vision uh, at a reasonable level for at least two years after um, getting back on track again. Unfortunately, those people who uh, stopped treatment and uh, remained off treatment also uh, went down and uh, this is a two year uh, difference there, but uh, um, certainly showing that if you stop and don't continue, uh, then you can uh, lose uh, vision more permanently as well. So the message again, um, uh, those patients in our study uh, up to say, six months didn't seem to have uh, uh, too much of an impact, but after that uh, it was more important. What about some of the um, newer treatments for uh, new vascular macular degeneration. So this little diagram shows um, some of the molecules that have been used. Um, in uh, the top left hand, we have pegaptinib or macugen, that was the first anti-VEGF um, agent, uh, which unfortunately was uh, uh, not really um, uh, so successful. Um, Bevacizumab or a vast uh, antibody here uh, with the FC and FAB portions. Uh, the ranibizumab was really a, a variant of the Avastin. Uh, this is the Lucentis, which was the first one designed for the eye. Uh, and then came a, uh, a flibicep with the VEGF trap, sort of trapping the two isoforms of VEGF uh, A there. Um, newer ones, uh, brolicizumab or Beerview, are uh, uh, small fragments. Uh, Ferisumab, we'll talk about shortly, and some of the Abisabar, Pego, uh, the DARPEN ones uh, are all. Um, slightly different again as well. But these are some of the agents which are, uh, have been used and uh, most uh, recently. Um, well, the Cizumab or Beerview um, is one of the newer treatments available on uh, PBS. Um, it's a small molecule, it's a single chain variant, and it's a smaller size, seems to allow more rapid and even tissue penetration and perhaps reduce systemic clearance. Um, these are the Hawke and Harris studies uh, founding that um, for wet macular degeneration that um, basically 12 weekly uh, brolicizumab was equivalent to eight weekly aflibercept uh, in terms of vision and anatomical uh, differences. So the top one is vision. The brolicizumab is in the light blue. Uh, two groups there, the aflibercept and the gray. It basically was non-inferior over two years in terms of change in vision um, for both Hawk and Harrier. Um, the OCT uh, differences, you can see that um, over 
uh, to use. It was similar. Um, if you look at the aflibiceps, um, you, you can see in the gray this sort of sawtoothing um, uh, area here where they've had treatment and then they respond, but it tends to wear off after a certain time. But the bolecizumab well, more robust um, stabilization of the CST um, over time, and both this was found in the Hawk and Harrier studies as well. So there seems to be at least an anatomical difference between a bolecizumab and a um here, but similar visual outcomes. When it was released, um, the uh, in our US colleagues started to report some uh, possible side effects uh, from uh, treatment, um, and the uh, issues came up with there was seemed to be uh, a slight increased risk of inflammatory or and vasculitic events in patients treated with bolecizumab. Um, and uh, this uh, did uh, uh, spark some concern uh, around the world. Um, if you look here, some of the actual um, inflammatory events in terms of percentage in bolecizumab versus aflibercept on the left and right. So the OI, IOI or intraocular inflammatory events, um, if, or any inflammatory events in bolecizumab, about 4.6% versus about 1.1% for aflibercept. Um, that the inflammatory events plus vasculitis, about 3%, um, and um, an occlusive event was about 2%. If you look at the number of people who had um, more than 15 letter vision loss, it was still a higher number in bolecizumab uh, compared to a flipper uh, in some of the post hoc analysis. So then um, a lot of data started to come through. Um, and this is some of the cases which were reported. Uh, this is a patient who had uh, some vasculitis over here. Um, and, um, and you can see this uh, occlusive uh, area down here of the retinal vessels. Um, this is a patient who uh, uh, had uh, uh, a hemorrhagic vasculitis. Um, and you can see some of these areas of sheathing around here. So we know that um, the, uh, some patients, not many patients who um, seem to have more inflammatory events. And uh, after that, the regulatory authorities around the world uh, put out messages um, to say, um, just beware. Um, they're still low, and I'll show you some cases on a bit later on, uh, but uh, patients need to be informed of this um, if they are to be uh, treated with this as well. So the port delivery system uh, is a um, system under trial at the moment. It's a surgical option for treating vascular macular degeneration, basically implanting a small clear reservoir, which can be topped up um, every six months or so. Um, this is quite a, a nice concept in terms of having a uh, device which you, is like a, a, a jar which you can fill up and then it slowly releases over time. Um, so um, the uh, portal study uh, and archway were looking at a port delivery device with um, ranibizumab or lucentis. And this is a study comparing um, monthly lucentis injections down the bottom with a uh, port delivery device with uh, refills every six months at the top here. You can see the treatment schedule here. And basically, uh, again, uh, very encouragingly, the port delivery system did not uh, was not uh, inferior and showed ma maintained vision over the two year period, uh, similar to the monthly injections of uh, Lucentis. Um, so without having um, injections in between. Um, so um, it sounds a very elegant way of treating patients, having one surgical device in the beginning and then a refill every six months. Uh, without having the uh, monthly or uh, injections in between. Um, again, OCT uh, differences as well was, was similar uh, between the two groups there. So I'm just going to pop through here. Um, the systemic safety seems to be fine uh, in the port delivery device. However, there were more ocular uh, adverse events um, with the port delivery device you know, being a surgical device, um, there were um, some issues at the beginning um, in terms of the technique, which uh, once it was sorted out, um, then the uh, amounts of AEs were reduced. Um, so 
um, positioning the uh, device and making sure the contract tower will, was uh, well covered um, uh, seemed to be important and it seemed to reduce the uh, risk of uh, infections inside the eye as well. So endophthalmitis and um, other uh, inflammatory events were reported more, but um, once the uh, technique was uh, uh, found to be uh, uh, perfected, then uh, the uh, AEs were certainly reduced after that. And uh, I think that was probably a, a learning uh, curve at the time. So it sounds uh, very nice that in some patients, it's um, you know, particularly for uh, rural patients, uh, one day we may be able to have um, uh, this uh, uh, device uh, implanted and um, then topped up every six months or so um, without the need for injections in between. What about furosemab? Um, so furosemab has been TGA approved for new vascular macular degeneration and DME and a submission to the PBS is underway. Uh, the trade name is the Biosmo. Uh, what is the Biosmo? It is the uh, first bi-specific uh, antibody uh, targeting two different pathways, uh, VEGF-A as well as ANG2. Um, what is ANG2? It's the angiotensin um, uh, 2 pathway and the TIE2. These are uh, two pathways involved in uh, homeostasis and uh, uh, vascular genesis. So ANG1 uh, is basically, it's like a yin and yang system. ANG1 keeps uh, blood vessels tight and maintains endothelial cell junctions uh, and basically um, uh, binds to TI2. Um, you have ANG2, uh, which is uh, uh, secreted under st stress and um, ischemic conditions, which can activate VEGF as well, and we get increasing uh, vascular leakage, uh, inflammation, and uh, the pericytic dropout and uh, um, uh, the cascade of inflammation around vessels. So we, uh, the BISMO is the, uh, the first antibody which can target both of them. The BISMO stands for uh, VEGF uh, and angiotensin bispecific molecule. Um, so the uh, two-year data from the uh, Tanaya and Lucerne studies, which are the macular degeneration arm, have been reported, um, basically showing that there is um, still some benefit um, out to um, 16 weeks. Um, so we look at the first year data, about 45% of people were out to four monthly injections, and about 80% were either three or four monthly injections. Um, the, the trial itself had a, it's like a treat and extend protocol or, or personalized treatment interval regime uh, where uh, things like vision and uh, OCT thickness were looked at and uh, to determine uh, what was the best uh, interval for the next treatment. Um, and it seemed that uh, this was a very uh, helpful way to try to mimic what we do in clinical practice. Um, and we can see that uh, over time, uh, they were comparable. Uh, in the gray, we have a flibercept given eight weekly for the duration of the two-year study uh, versus the purple furosemab um, matching um, the, the same vision. So basically, there's non-inferior uh, in vision over the two years. Um, so encouragingly, it seems to be that many people at uh, two years were able to get out to uh, four monthly. So again, 60% um, um, in four monthly, and when you combine both uh, three monthly and four monthly group, about seventy-five to eighty percent of people were able to be given every three to four months, which is um, still a significant reduction in injection numbers and treatment burden reduced as well. So I'm just going to flick through this in um, for the interest of time. So useful thing about uh, the interesting thing about uh, this data shows that the ocular inflammatory rates seem to be low as well. So there was not really uh, any signals in terms of increased uh, ocular inflammation uh, as with some uh, other um, products as well, which is encouraging. So what's in the pipeline? Um, there are many molecules to target uh, in terms of leakage. Um, ANG2 is one of the new ones. Um, an Australian company, Othea, is looking at targeting a VEGF-C and VEGF-D, in addition to a VEGF-A, 
inhibition, uh, and this is uh, uh, part, part of what we call the COAST study, which is currently recruiting. Um, uh, we're involved with this as well. If any of you have patients who you might think might benefit from being on a clinical trial, please contact us. Um, the uh, Basically, phase two data seem to suggest that uh, combined uh, VEGFC and D inhibition was seem to be superior to uh, just VEGFA inhibition and therefore moving on to a, a phase three study. Um, so uh, it's underway. It'll be very interesting to see whether the, what the results are uh, coming up. Um, this is just a flow chart, just looking at so what happens in, in study patients as well. Um, so the other interesting thing is uh, sort of slow release devices. So we were involved in this uh, phase one study, the OTX study, uh, looking at a, um, a hydrogel-based um, product, which was slowly releasing a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So basically, it's a bit like dexamethasone implant. You uh, put it inside the eye, and it slowly dissolves, releasing um, the active ingredient. Um, and uh, some patients on the phase one trial uh, seem to be able to get out to you know nine months um, on the trial without the need for injection. So this is um, it's still a phase one. The uh, phase two trials are underway at the moment. We'll see whether um, that will go to a phase three trial. So um, the aims are still trying to achieve uh, good vision, maintain, uh, prevent vision loss with longer duration of um, durability and less injections. So I'd just like to finish with some of the, the cases. Um, so first case here is a, uh, and with the cases, um, if you have, uh, please feel free in the chat uh, function to um, uh, uh, to uh, answer some, uh, put some answers there if I'm, uh, so, uh, so this is a 93 year old Asian uh, female who's had uh, cataract extraction, metal history, hypertension, vision of 648 right eye and 6 on 95 left eye. Here we can see the left fundus picture. Um, I'll probably talk to you about this, but uh, uh, we can see a hemorrhage here. Um, there is uh, exudate here and it seems to be quite thickened there. The right eye has some drusen. OCT of the left eye, so some shrim, um, which is subretinal fluid, uh, sorry, pigment epithelial detachment here in a large complex there. There is a uh, vitreomacular traction in the right eye. And the fluorescein shows this quite discrete lesion here and some leakage on the fluorescein angiogram there. Some drews in the right eye um, at the moment, no sign of any leakage in the right eye. So, Please use your chat there. Does anyone put some of the clinical findings in, in the left eye at all? Um, I'm just going to put this uh, down. So hemorrhage in the left eye, there's intraretinal fluid, um, shrum, as we mentioned, the pigment epithelial attachment, lipid exudase, soft confluent drusen, and a focal complex of neovascularization. The right eye at this point in time had some intraretinal fluid, confluent drusen, and victory macular traction. So what's the diagnosis? Um, this is a type three MNV or, or uh, what we used to call a RAP lesion. The right eye has some vitreomacular macular traction with high risk non-exudative uh, macular degeneration. So the top one you can see a um, uh, baseline and treated at that point, uh, you can see some of the PD settling down and some of the lipid exudate settling. Um, vision uh, a bit better, but uh, not significantly better due to the chronicity. Uh, this is more an established lesion as well. So the right eye initially had vitreo macular traction, but six months later, you can see there's increase in fluid there. And then you can say, well, is that just from increased vitreo macular traction or is there something else going on? Um, and you, this is where angiography can be helpful. She had a OCT angiogram and they showed there was a new lesion in the right eye here. So she's developed a type three MNV in the right eye six months later as well. And this is a 64 year old Caucasian female who had good vision, uh, but some drusenoid deposits in her right eye. 
Six years later, she came back and had a big bleed in her right macula. So the OCT shows a lot of shrim, hemorrhage, PED in the right eye. Fluorescein uh, masking blood. ICG angiogram, not particularly helpful there because of the blood. So we started on a flipercept at that point and did quite well. You can see there's an improvement over time from 6.48 to, to 6.24. on And basically um, maintained on four weekly until she improved. Um, at this point down the bottom, we tried to extend her and the vision uh, slipped back a bit. So it uh, was maintained on six weekly injections. Um, she had a villa in Bali, which she had to attend to uh, for business reasons and uh, tried to get out to as long as she could between her injections, as, again, highlighting you know, their day-to-day -day, um, you know, issues that patients have who have injections. Um, so she elected to come back eight weeks after her Bali trip, but you can see the vision had dropped from 6.15 to 6.30 with an increase of fluid here. Um, 10 weeks was worse as well. So she elected eight weeks because she had said she couldn't get in earlier because of her um, trips to Bali. So at this point, we switched to Beerview or bolucizumab. Um, this is baseline. So we checked her for any vasculitis, um, any issues at that point, uh, no problems. So basically switching to uh, bolucizumab, we can see there's reduction in shroom and uh, improvement in fluid. And eight weekly at view view is still her vision is going well. So um, at eight weekly uh, bolucizumab, uh, she seemed to be doing better than on eight weekly aflibercept. So there's some patients, and there was no sign of any side effects at all. So she's done well on uh, bolucizumab, uh, even though we counselled her about the risk of uh, side effects. This patient just highlights um, that we need to tailor uh, treatments to individual patients in order to um, maximize their uh, outcomes. So um, thank you for your attention. Um, that's all I have to say tonight. Um, please uh, ask, ask some questions if you have, and uh, we'll catch up with you shortly. Thank you so much, James, for a fantastic overview of the current landscape of near vascular AMD. Um, I would just like to remind you all that we do welcome your questions. I can see a couple of them in the Q&A box at the moment. Um, so continue to enter those and I'll just give a quick overview of how the MDFA supports patients and healthcare professionals. By referring patients with macular disease, whether they are newly diagnosed or have established disease to the MDFA, you are ensuring that they can ask those questions about their diagnosis. So we provide individualized support tailored to their specific need and where they are in their journey, whether that is evidence-based education, resources, patient webinars, information on risk management, and the types of dietary and lifestyle changes that may improve outcomes. Feedback from our macular disease community has led to MDFA developing several different modes of peer support, where people living with macular disease can share their lived experience. MDFA also offers a patient support program for those undergoing intravitreal injections for neovascular AMD. The program aims to equip patients with greater health literacy, promote treatment adherence and connect patients with emotional and practical support and resources that can help them reduce the risk of progression. You can quickly refer patients to MDFA via Oculo or via our website e-referral form, and they will receive a call from our highly trained services team within three working days. And as healthcare professionals, MDFA are keen to support your work. So for those of you who have an interest in eye disease, you can subscribe to Macular Matters, our quarterly e-newsletter, which is a quick read and update of what is happening in the macular disease sector, as well as MDFA initiatives that may assist you or your patients. We also have free CPD accredited courses for optometrists, orthoptists, GPs and pharmacists on diabetic eye disease and AMD. Um, in addition, we will soon be releasing a course on inherited retinal diseases, so you can stay tuned for that one as well. 
Um, I'm now going to invite James back to answer your questions. So James, I could see there's, there's a couple of questions here in the Q&A box. Um, so the first one is, are there any differences in the referral timings and urgency between the different M and V types? Yeah, thanks, Mira. That's uh, it's a good question. Um, so um, the type 3 MNV is more of an aggressive lesion. So um, it's, it would be nice to <clears throat> see these patients earlier. <clears throat> In terms of once you diagnose um, uh, wet macular degeneration, um, people say, well, how soon do people need to be treated in order to you know, not affect outcomes? And they looked a bit of at this uh, in some studies. Basically, two weeks was a nice number to remember. So, if patients um, had were treated within two weeks of usually other symptoms or diagnosis, then they didn't seem to make a difference in terms of the long term, uh, in terms of their um, their vision. However, if it was delayed more than two weeks, uh, there seemed to be uh, an impact on their vision. Um, so. Uh, the message is if uh, you know if you do pick up patients with you know suspect wet AMD, if they do need to be you know ideally within two weeks, um, um, if we you know people uh, many centres we can see people urgently you know same day if necessary, and certainly um, if a patient's had you know poor outcome in one eye and have a very aggressive lesion in the other eye, um, that certainly can um, make a difference. So in terms of the order, uh, M and V is an aggressive lesion. Um, uh, some types of PCV can be aggressive and if there's a, a hemorrhage. If you see a hemorrhage in the eye with macula, um, yeah. that's often quite, can be a, quite a, you know, a more an aggressive lesion. Um, type 2 lesions probably next in, in line. And then the type 1 lesions can be the, you know, the grumbling type of occult, we used to call it grumbling occult lesions. Um, they tend to be uh, <clears throat> a bit less aggressive. Um, these are ones with uh, intraretinal fluid and sometimes with a PED. Um, so these ones uh, are probably as a group um, are probably the the less the least aggressive uh, still you know still should be treated um, but um, uh, tend to have less um, uh, uh, you know rapid progression over time. That's great. Um, there is one more I see you've answered it but I might just read it out so everyone can hear the question. Uh, where can we get more information on enrolling patients and the criteria for the Opthea trial? Um, yes, so look, the, the Opthea trial where uh, is being run out of a few centres um, in Sydney, uh, where I work at Strathall Retina Clinic is one of the centres, there are two other centres in Sydney, and uh, for interstate um, uh, attendees, there are other sites. If you please, if you could, if you wish to, any you like to leave some of your details, uh, we can just uh, send some details to you with regard to the uh, protocol, the criteria, and some information uh, about um, about the Opthea trial. Um, and I'm happy to, if you have any, you know, questions, happy to take them, you know, personally um, at at our centre here. Uh, you know, we have ten retina specialists who can uh, who can, um, you know. Um, see the patients if you uh, necessary. Um, so it's, uh, it's you know we we try to you know support you know uh, research in as much as we can, particularly Australian companies, which is quite unique in this situation. Um, so um, we are so if you have uh, any queries, we can send you the protocol and some information about that as well. Great, I think that that's all the questions there, James. Thank you so much. Um, thanks so much for making time in your, I'm sure, very busy schedule to provide, I think, what has been a really educational evening with some great insights that I think we can all take to practice. Um, for those of you who have found this webinar useful, I encourage you to complete the free and accredited courses through the MDFA website. And lastly, you will be receiving a post-webinar evaluation survey directly after this session. And we would really appreciate your feedback to ensure our next CPD event is even more pertinent and useful to your practice. Many thanks again, James, and good night, everyone. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you for everyone for attending.